And experience has nothing to do with language. So then how do we capture that? How do we capture lived experience? Remember also another difference that I introduced earlier on in class is going to be going for now. Gilbert Ryle's distinction between knowing that and knowing how. Knowing that, the blank is always filled by a sentence, a declarative sentence. Knowing that Colombo discovered America in 1492, the sentence can be false. Knowing that the Steelers won the last Super Bowl. I don't think so. But nevertheless, the sentence has the right form to be true or false. That's all that matters as far as this goes. Someone from Philadelphia or from Pennsylvania may stick to the idea that the Steelers won the last Super Bowl. Well, it was the Green Bay Packers, I'm sorry. But nevertheless, it would make sense. Knowing how the blank is not, the blank is an infinitive verb but that refers to an actual activity, knowing how to swim, knowing how to ride a bicycle. Yes, we're using language, but you don't learn it by using language. Knowing how is taught by example. Here, kid, this is how you do it. And it's learned by practice. Okay, now it's my turn. And you have to do it a million times until you find it becomes a skill that you'll never forget in your life. You don't use a bicycle for three years, and it all comes back to you right away. Where is that stored? How is that stored? Well, it clearly is throughout your body, because it's not your central nervous system sending a bunch of instructions. It's the way that your hands remember the, how, to, how to turn, the way you, your feet remember how to use the parapel, or in the case of swimming, the very feeling of water will remind you of many things. It's about autobiographical memory. It's about remembering how you learned it, and then it becomes part of you. For a symbolic artificial intelligence, this deals mostly with knowing that connectionism, which is the human version, deals mostly with knowing how. The human tradition is called connectionism. And its main product is a type of software called neural nets. Now, neural nets are not programmed. They don't have a single line of code in them. Because, of course, lines of code are words. And are words that come from logical calculi. So if we have to put words into neural nets, if then do this, well, that's already going back to our stall. So neural nets learn by training. You need to show them what to do. You need to teach them by example. And they learn how to do it, whatever it is that you want it to do, by doing it over and over and over again for a period of time, a training period of time. And then once the training is finished, they know how to do it. They know how to do it. The most important things that neural nets know how to do right now is how to recognize patterns. So here I need to make that slide. Stop before we go on. I said that the material world, before human beings came to the, into the scene, so think of the material world, think of planet Earth six million years ago. Six million years ago, there wasn't even an inkling of a human. There were already the primates that are our common ancestors with chimpanzees, the last common ancestor that we have with them, but those were not humans. So what did that material world with no humans in it contain? It contained matter, inorganic matter, organic matter, and so on. It contained energy. And it contained information. Physical information. Which basically means pattern. The word information, when you talk about information technology, 
means physical information. Computers don't understand semantics. You know, we, we use the word information in two senses. Information in the sense of physical information, the, the processing of information by computers, but then, then you, you know, we also use it in the sense of what do, where do you get your information? Well, I get it from reading newspapers, or I read it from uh, the CNN website, which now means language. But this information doesn't have anything to do with language. It simply means order. It simply means matter and energy that have been arranged in a certain order. Nevertheless, physical, infor and physical information exists entirely objectively. So it, was, it is because the world, before you know, the world when it was inhabited by mostly for the two billion years, it was inhabited mostly by bacteria, amoebas, paramecia, and a bunch of unicellular organisms, was filled with information was because light bounces off objects and, and those light beams carry information about the color and shape of those objects. They, they, they carry in their waves a, a modulated patterns that carry information about objects. And because the air was filled with little chemical molecules that carry chemical information about entities. And because the air was filled with shaped pattern pulses that carry information about in the form of sound about other entities. It was because the world was filled with pattern in the air, in the light, in form of the form of chemicals and so on, that our senses evolved. There would have been no reason for the ear to evolve, or for the eyes to evolve, or for the a sense of taste to evolve, for our sense of our of, of uh, you know aromas or a smell to evolve if there had not been previously information to take advantage of. Remember, evolution is opportunistic. Evolution cannot go, well, I'm going to develop an eye because in the future there will be information carried by light. It's rather, there is this opportunity now because light is bouncing off all these different objects and if we develop a nice way of focusing it and then a nice way of processing that information, we could actually see that eyes eventually evolve. So the world, the material world we're talking about is matter, is energy, and is pattern. Some parts of the world don't have any pattern. They are random. Some other parts of the world have too much pattern. They are boring and repetitive. There are areas of the world that have variable patterns. So pattern is there. A pattern is there for animals to identify and develop ever more discriminating organs to make use of that information. Had information not been there to begin with, there would have been no reason for us to evolve senses. So it's not as if our senses created the information. It is the other way around. Now, neural nets are all about pattern. Neural nets are pattern, pattern recognition devices, or to put it in a different way, they map a pattern in their input layers to a pattern in their output layers. Let me explain how they, how they work. Neural net, the components. The first component is several computing, several computing units that are extremely simple, capable, only of calculating their own intensity of activation. We're back to intensities. As you can imagine already, activation. Their own intensity of activation. All they can do. So clearly, the computing units are nothing like the CPUs in your in your in your laptop, which is an incredibly elaborate millions of transistors packed into that CPU. It can do a million things. Uh, 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 the computing units that go into a neural net are the simplest possible computers. All they can do is calculate how intense, in, to, to what degree of intensity am I excited, or to what degree of intensity am I inhibited. That's it. But remember, the word intensity is there. And the word intensity 
is what links us to the material world. That's what, that's, that is what makes perception directly linkable. Number two, a set of changeable connections I want you to 
imagine that the second one is also connected to every single one of those, the third one is also connected to every single one of those, the fourth one is also connected, and so on. Because I, can, I cannot do that, otherwise it's going to become a mess. I'm going to try to, but warning. And so on for every unit, right? They are not connected among themselves, though. They're just connected to the output layer. Everyone is connected, and at the beginning of the training, every connection is at full strength, or rather, at medium strength, but homogeneously so. The training procedure consists in teaching it by example. So what you need to do is present it with faces, and then push it over, or push it closer, because what you're telling is it's like training a dog. You know, you, you, you want it to come closer, but you push him a little closer. You want it to get him away, you push him a little away. And let's assume that being pushed away produces a pattern here that is one black, one white, one black, one white. And the opposite is move closer. Black, white, black, white will be moved closer. So during the training procedure, what you do is you present it with a face, or a set of faces, which is going to create a pattern of activation in the input layer. And then you give it the correct pattern of activation at the output layer. If it's a face, it's a pattern that means move closer. If it's not a face, there's a pattern that means move away, right? And you do it several times. Now what happens, and the basic principle is this, neurons that fire together connect together. That's the kind of slogan for it. In other words, for every pair of these fake neurons, these virtual neurons, if two of them are always active together, like these two, their connection will become strengthened. Become thicker. <coughs> if, on the contrary, this one, is, which is when it's connected to that one, both are inactive at the same time, the connection starts becoming weaker. So during the training process, what you're producing is a changing pattern of strengths in the connections. This is why it's called connectionism. It is the connections that remember things. Not the units, but the connections. The connections remember, because now I'm a super strong connection, even every little bit of activity, activity I'm going to transmit it if the two neurons on its side were always active. If the two neurons on its side were always not active, were inhibited, then the connection starts losing its strength until that virtually disappears. It's still there, but it cannot carry any more activation anymore. So at the end of the training, you started with connections, all of which had the exact same value, a medium capacity to transmit activation. At the end, you end up with a bunch of connections, each one with its own capacity to transmit activation. Someone will be super strong, someone will be not strong at all, someone will be medium strong, right? So now that's the training. Now, so this is the <coughs> At the end of training, you don't have to push the car far and forth anymore. At the end of the training, you just present it with a face. The face creates this activation pattern. Then now the, but now the connections are, have different abilities to, to transmit. So for instance, this connection will immediately turn this one on because it's connected by someone very, very strong. But this connection from here to here is not going to, right? Because this one was active, but this one wasn't active. You might transmit a little bit of, of activation, but not much. And so on, so that creating the input pattern through the new pattern of connections recreates the output pattern. So what, what plays the role of memory here is the pattern of strengths of the connections. Because through that pattern of strengths, you can, by giving it the original input, get the original output. And, for, and then from now on, every time you show it a face, the, the, the little robot will come closer. Every time you show it something that's not a face, the little robot will, will move 
farther away. Now, the first electron is the simplest of all neural nets. There are many other, I'm not going to be able, unfortunately, guys, to explain you in super detail all of connectionism. I'm going to have to, that's going to have to be your homework. Because now you can introduce intermediate layers called hidden layers. You can organize them into flat maps called self-organizing maps. You can create feedback connections from one to the other and create what's called recurrent neural nets. There are all kinds of different designs. The important thing for this class is not that you learn about all there is to know about neural nets. It's that you see that for the first time in history, we have a perfectly well-defined formal paradigm as to what know-how is. The Kantians were winning all the time because they had the syllogism to point to. If you see, 2,500 years ago, Aristotle discovered that, and no one has done anything better than that. Therefore, you know, be on our side. And they, and they had an exemplary achievement to point to as their trophy. This is our trophy, this is our exemplary achievement. As long as we continue with deductive logic and then inductive logic that way, we're going to understand the mind. Know how the, 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 the knowledge stored as skills in your body, or even as routines in your body, as habits, we have not had something similar to the syllogism. Now, even at the level of a perceptron, we have. Because a lot of what happens in animal intelligence is a matter of associating two patterns. And this is exactly what a computer, a neural network work does. It associates a pattern in its input, that is a pattern of sensations, with a motor pattern, with a pattern of what to do. Animals do that, you know, for instance, the person trying captures something about insect intelligence. That's how simple it is. It doesn't tell us anything about humans. But nevertheless, in the human tradition, there is a continuity between animal intelligence and human intelligence. Think about honeybees, for instance. Honeybees inherit a reflex which, that in such a way that every time their antennas touch something sugary, like nectar or honey or something sugary, their tongue comes out and begins licking that nectar, and they get all excited, right? But they are born with that. But they are not born with the ability to see flowers, the color of flowers, or the aroma of flowers. What they have to do is, during their lifetimes, they have to learn to associate the presence of nectar, the presence of that, the presence of that substance that's going to make them get all excited and, and lick their, their antennas, with with a single color dominating a region, because that may indicate lots of flowers in the region, with certain chemicals that are fl floral aromas, since the presence of a floral aroma also tells you where nectar is going to be, or even with multi, with a certain geometrical arrangement of petals, like radiating patterns from the middle. That they have to learn to associate through a neural network. Right? They get exposed to to nectar. I mean, they go for nectar, but they get, they get exposed to, in this particular case, a flower. And they have to learn to always go closer to that pattern and to go away from patterns that are not like that. That is how bees learn how to go from a beehive to the place where there are flowers. That's how they learn how to follow floral aromas or an expanse of color, and then find out that there is nectar there. They, they, don't, they don't learn it the first time. They have to be exposed several times, just like the neural network needs to be exposed several times. But after they learn to make the association between the presence of nectar and the presence of color, the presence of aroma, the presence of multi-petal geometries, now they know that association and they go directly for the flowers. So perceptrons, capture something about insect intelligence that's far away from humans. But nevertheless, they work. And because they work, even if they don't work for the human case, they at least give us an exemplary achievement that works exclusively with intensities, that is directly connected to the human, to, to the world, because 
you're connecting what you see with what you do, you know, with some kind of classifications, the common words, and so on. It's about doing. And, as I said, the perceptron is the simplest example comes from the 60s. Today we have at least seven or eight different designs, much more powerful than the perceptron, <coughs> much more capable of learning about different types of patterns. So connectionism is going to re-inject life in the human vision of experience. It's going to, is, you, you will see that in this century, connectionism is going to develop into an, an entire industry in a few decades, it's going to leave symbolic artificial intelligence behind. Because the only limit to connection is <laughs> neural networks is the designers. It's a matter of design. Let's see who can design the better neural network. Every time the symbolic artificial intelligence guys say, no, that's not going to work. Someone comes up with a better design. And every time a symbolic artificial intelligence says, well, there are limits to this design. Well, yes, there are limits. But they can be overcome by this other design. And that has been the history of the last 40 years. They are fighting for funds from DARPA, they are fighting for funds for, from the military to see who, who comes up with the better robots and so on. So in those fights, the symbolic artificial intelligence crowds so always trying to put this down. And when they put them down, all the all they cause is for someone else to come on and say, yes, that might be a limitation, but this other design, look what it does. So the only limitations really are the ingenuity of the designers. We have found the principle. To repeat it again, the memory is stored in the connections. You don't store a representation. You store the means to reproduce the representation. And that's the problem that we started with. Autobiographical memories, that scene from the fireplace with a wooden cabin, with a nice mellow music, with the smell of jasmine, any one of those inputs, the smell of jasmine by itself, the music by itself, the fire by itself, bow, brings about the whole memory. Which means that what we had stored in our head was the means to reproduce the original lived experience. And all it needed was a chunk a large enough of the original input. Well, the same thing happens with neural networks. If to a neural network that was trained with this pattern, you only give it this three, in many cases, it's capable of reproducing the full output pattern with an incomplete input pattern. Right? Because it's storing the memory in the strengths of the connections. It's not storing patterns. It's storing the means to produce a pattern. So neural networks, for the first time, even though they only work at the level of insects, already suggest how they're going to be useful to model human autobiographical memory all about intensities, patterns of intensities. Okay guys, fortunately the class has come to an end. This good class, this class will go on and on and on because there are a million other things to talk about, but unfortunately, time's up. Questions? Yes. <laughs> Fair with this one. Um, so, when talking about communities and trying to understand what is the connection between community and um, individual perception, for instance. So, um, I guess the connection would be through language or through some sort of common understanding. So, because with individual perception, if you, the blue I see is different than the blue you see physically because the light is bouncing off and it's passing it through so many processes. So just by physical nature, we do not see the same color blue. But we have to make some sort of common ground to say, you know, this is blue. So I guess what I'm trying to understand is at you know at what point is does language overcome it becomes more important than perception because because essentially, as, as far as communicating to, things from one because in order to have a community, you have to have a language. The perceptions are private; words can be shared. But the perception itself becomes a shared experience because if you need to make some sort of common language, and I'm holding up a cup and I tell you it's a cup full of water, and I say, you know, this is a rug. I could be talking about the cup, or I could be talking about the water. Your perception of what I'm talking about comes from your own experience. 
but the way to create that common language has to be, we have to create some sort of common ground between our own perception. So how does, how, how are communities formed through perception versus, you know, to create a language? Well, here the, the main distinction would be, do we need words necessarily, or would common habits would be enough? I mean, the human, remember that for a human, is routines and habits what really join us together. It is sharing common practices, doing similar things in the community. Everybody sweeps the front of their houses. Everybody cleans their windows. Everybody takes care of their babies. Whether they are doing it silently or out loud, it's entirely immaterial. If we had all the same words and shared words, but people took care of babies in one house and chimpanzees in another and, and, and little cats in the other, and there was no commonality of lifestyle, there was no commonality of habits and routines, we would not be able to communicate either. So both are important. We do need words to narrow down reference, as you just mentioned. You know, are you referring to the cop? Are you referring to the contents of the cop? So, so because it's ambiguous, you need language to disambiguate the reference in that particular case. But we also need common habits and routines to be able to understand, to be able to make sense of what everybody else is doing. Yeah, well, she's sweeping the floor because yesterday she didn't sweep it. Or she's cleaning the windows because they were too dirty. But, you know, you're using language, but at the same time you're referring to something that you yourself do. It's those common habits and common routines that also join us together in addition to a common language. Right? So, so we need both. We need both Hume and we need Kant. The question, the question is not so much whether you need language or not. The question is what comes first? And what comes first in the baby's life? Does, it come, does, does, does a coherent world which you can crawl through and point at and grab things from comes first or, 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 or talking comes first? Well, in the case of the baby, everybody knows that they first learn to live the world they first learn to inhabit the world, and only later they begin to apply words to the, to, the, to the world. I would say the same thing is true of everything. Words are important, but only to the extent that they are linked to practices where they make a difference. This is related, by the way, to a distinction I made yesterday, or rather, Wednesday night, did I see you on Wednesday night? Were you there on Wednesday night? Okay. <laughs> so now we know who sort of thought, let's skip the lecture. The confusion about this, I and mean, I'm not saying that you're confused because your question was very much to the point. Right? But the confusion that you could have understanding my answer to it is because there's two meanings Putting this thing down. 
Significance has nothing to do with language. Significance is about importance, relevance, or capacity to make a difference. If you come to me and you tell me my life has no meaning. And I tell you, yes, it does. You know, I'll tell you what the meaning of life is. And I go to a, di to, to a, to a dictionary and life, capacity to be, you know, to reproduce. Or, you know, you would, you would think, what an idiot. I should not come to this person with a very, very personal thing, right? When you say, my life has no meaning, you're not saying my life lacks definition or my life is, my life is ambiguous. It says, I feel insignificant. I feel like I don't make a difference in anybody's lives. I don't make a difference in my kids' lives. They hate me. Every time I say something, they go, go fuck yourself. They think I don't make a difference in my, in, my, in my wife's life. I don't make a difference in my brother's life. I feel meaningless. I, I don't feel like I, I have any importance or relevance to anything. If you respond to that question, if somebody comes to you saying in a particular, in a very intense way, I feel meaningless, and you try to tell them something linguistic, you're going to end, you're going to farther ruin their lives. You're going to confuse the hell out of them. They are not talking about anything having to do with language. Now, when it comes to interpreting community life and having shared experiences and making sense of what other people are doing, and, and, and being able to put yourself in their shoes, being empathetic, and all of the things that you need to have a real community. A lot of times you're talking about significance, not about signification. It's like, he didn't reciprocate that favor. What does that mean? You're not saying, what does that mean linguistically? You're saying, what? You know, why did he reciprocate that favor? I mean, why, what, you're talking about now the behavior, trying to make sense of the behavior. Was it significant that he forgot that favor? Or is it something that I can forget about? Does it really make a difference? Because, you know, I took care of his kids last night. And then I'm asking him to take care of my kids today. And he's like, no, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, I'm too busy. Should that make a difference in the way in which I behave toward that person? Should I not ever do favors for that person again? Or should I consider it to be an insignificant thing? Maybe he was too busy. Maybe he would have taken care of my kids had the situation been different. You have to make those calculations. They're not have anything to do with language. In fact, you may not even have to use any language. Your own feelings tell you, you know, that was not insignificant. He right now, he, he, he told me if he could take care of my kids. Now I'm in a bind. And he's not going to do it. I will never do a favor to that person. Now that's a matter of intensity. Right? The intensity of the anger that you have right now towards that person. Now, animals, can perceive significance. They, they, can, they can perceive when something affords them danger and therefore can make a bad difference in their lives. Or they can perceive and, and, and run away. Or they can perceive when something supplies them with an opportunity to eat. You know, something affords them the opportunity, the, a nutritional opportunity, and therefore it's a significant thing. They ignore most things that are insignificant to them. In the way they had to be thinking about everything at the same time, they would probably be paralyzed. The fact of the matter is that most animals come with filters for insignificances, for irrelevances, for things that are unimportant. So they can focus their attention on only, only the things that matter, only the things that make a difference. We inherit that from animals. Our ability to make sense of things with that language, to make sense in terms of their importance, not their semantic content, of course. Now, in reality, we use them both. Because many times, I can have this confused feeling about whether that's significant or not, and then I, I need to go with a friend and have a conversation in which the meaning of words plays a very important role to try to figure out just what happened now. Hey, forgive him. Maybe, you know, he went like this. No, this is an unforgivable thing. No, but if you think that maybe his wife died, then, you know, and you have a long conversation, and then all of a sudden you come to see, oh, yeah, well, maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe he didn't really mean to be an, an idiot. Maybe he didn't really mean to be an asshole. Maybe I should have really put him in my blacklist. And that comes from a very detailed conversation where semantic meanings played a big role. 
And for that, you need those friends with whom you can have those conversations. Many people don't have the, the verbal abilities to actually, you know, dedicate to an analysis of the situation and try to convince you and so on, or give you a pep talk or something like that. So in reality, in human reality anyway, both are used at the same time. And you can make a difference with words. A good pep talk is a good example. A bad pep talk is not a good example, right? So, so your girlfriend or your boyfriend is very sad. They just got fired. He's crying. And uh, you want him to kind of forget about it. So you come up with a nice pep talk in which you minimize the importance of that job. That job sucked anyway. They were exploiting you. And you know, employment figures are, 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 are now getting fixed. And I'll bet you're going to get a job in the next three weeks. She stops crying. Everybody's happy again. This, you try to use that exact pep talk the following day, and it's not going to work because, hey, wait a minute, didn't I hear that pep talk already? So you need abilities to use language in significant ways, and you need to be able to appreciate the significance and importance of relevance of certain words and not certain words. So the two tend to go together for humans. But for animals who don't have signification, we cannot make sense of their very coherent behavior. You know, Walls hunt in, in teams. They learn to hunt together. How could they possibly do that? How could they coordinate their actions with that language? Well, they have a few signals and so on. But the signals act more like triggers than messages that carry lots of complex semantic information. Because together they can see significance of things. They can see, for instance, that a cliff affords you danger because you can fall down. And that therefore, if you trap a deer, against the cliff, the deer is not going to leap over the cliff. Because most animals don't do that. Most animals have immediate, uh, an immediate perception of things that afford them a risk, a supply them with a risk. So wolves can take advantage of that, pushing a, a deer little by little towards the cliff and then trapping the, cliff, trapping the deer against the cliff. How do they do it? They don't have these mental representations or categories and so on. But they can take advantage of what they know about the significance of things, the significance of the opportunities and risks that the layout of the environment affords you. Right? So we, from, as, as humans, we will take this as very important. It's what marks our continuity with animal perception. But we also take this as very important. The question here is how to include language? There's two ways of doing it. We need to include language in materialist philosophy. But do we need to include it as part of perception? Or as part of belief? This would be the Kantian choice. This would be the Humean choice. Perception is, of course, the idea that language itself is changing our perception of things, literally. But in a human, language is important because it changes our beliefs. So one tells us something about somebody else, well, you know, and I used to believe he was a good friend. Now I don't believe that he's a good friend. Or I used to believe that I had more money than I thought I had, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Because of the Kantian domination of the 20th century, we have come to replace completely this with that. Think, for instance, about the expression public perception versus public opinion. At the beginning of the 20th century, people in the media, say in the radio and so on, or in newspapers, talked about public opinion. It's the beliefs that people hold. Today, most television channels, radio channels, newspapers use it with the expression public perception. They say, for instance, they the public perception of George W. Bush has changed. What, is, what does that mean? Does it really mean that the first time I saw him on TV with the smirk and the ignorant face, I thought that he was a genius, and then I had, you know, my perception changed, changed, and now I think he's an idiot? Or do I still see the same idiot face with the smirk and everything, except that now I used to have the belief that the guy was competent, but now I don't have that belief. Now I believe that he's an incompetent guy. Everything that you can do with perceptions. You know, one of the reasons why feminists and uh, uh, people in, in Afro-American studies and other, in other 
feel that the humanities that deal with minorities prefer this is because, of course, it's, it's a very easy way to account for how stereotypes, stereotypes of women, stereotypes of blacks, stereotypes of orientals, stereotypes of Mexicans, affect the way we treat people, right? If you think that all women are inherently weaker, well, that's going to affect the, 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 the way you treat women. But the question is, is the, is the, is the stereotype, which is, of course, a piece of language, the fairer sex or something like that, or the weaker sex, is that phrase, which is a linguistic phrase, affecting literally our perception of women, or is it affecting our beliefs about women? From the point of view of the behavior of a sexist guy, you're not going to be able to tell the difference. Because he, all you're going to see is, is his behavior, the way he's behaving towards women. Right? Treating them as weaklings, treating them as someone who needs to be defended, treating them as someone who cannot make decisions on their own because they are too weak to make decisions on their own and so forth. It's the behavior of the person that matters. But behavior can be produced by false beliefs, stereotypical beliefs, or stereotypical perceptions. So my, obviously, I side with the human side. I, I don't think that my perception of W. Bush changed at all. I mean, the literal perception of his ugly face is the exact same perception. I just came to go from, he's an idiot, to he is the king of idiots, right? I changed my beliefs about him, and that changes my attitudes, my behavior, the way I respond to many questions about W. Bush. The problem is, from the moment we switched from public opinion to public perception, that change in the, in the vernacular signaled the triumph of Kantianism in the 20th century. It came to dominate even ordinary language, which is why it's going to be almost, in, not almost impossible, but extremely hard to create a human century, right? to kind of break with the 20th century, to create something new, thanks to neural nets, thanks to, to the notion of know-how, Thanks to all, a bunch of things that I've been trying to introduce in class, and in particular the belief in a material world and the belief in non-linguistic practices in which you constantly interact in the world. But for the, for the purpose of talking about racial stereotypes, gender stereotypes, and other types of stereotypes, Hume can handle that as well as Kant. Okay? You don't have to commit yourself to the fact that stereotypes literally shape your perception of women literally shape the perception of blacks, or they literally shape the perception of Mexicans. You can say they change, they affect your beliefs about Mexicans. All Mexicans are Speedy Gonzalez type of, you know, siesta taking, you know, uh, 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 cactus uh, loving people. You know, or whatever other, you know, mariachi dancing people. Right? That's a belief. That's a stereotype belief. And am I, can I say, for instance, in the name of all Mexicans, we are not like that. We don't love cacti, or chihuahua dogs, or take big... In fact, we don't even take siestas, for God's sakes. Who came up with that one? I would like to change those beliefs, but I don't believe that what that is doing is affecting your perception of me as a Mexican. Right? Affecting your beliefs of me as a Mexican. And the same thing with any other minority. So one of the main reasons to sustain this idea, which was to, be a, to account for gender stereotypes and racial stereotypes and so on is gone. Once we understand that beliefs can do the job. Right. And beliefs are, of course, beliefs. Belief. Belief. I believe that. Blah, blah, blah. With a sentence. Are linguistic. It's just that they are not affecting perception. They are affecting your behavior. A perception. So we can retain a lot of what we used to have from Kant without necessarily becoming Kantians. Now that's a long answer, huh? <laughs> you didn't expect that long answer. Yes. Okay, this is a two part question. First part, um, when you, on Wednesday night you presented uh, the different kind of regimes where, where we could use computation to address certain questions about structural performance and usefulness and aesthetics. And aesthetics came down and you, you, you used new neural networks in a possible way. Of and whereas in structure and use uh, multi-chain systems and uh, so on. Is not, are, I mean, are neural networks not a branch of multi-chain systems? That's the first problem. I, I'm going to repeat that again. Okay, are, are neural networks not a branch of multi-chain systems? 
A branch of Kantian systems? No, multi-agent systems. Oh, I see. What? You can, you, there are some multi-agent systems that use neural nets. In the sense that, you know, every agent is just a neural net that's learning pattern recognition, and that is how they behave. But, may, but, but, but it's not necessarily. So the answer is yes, but not necessarily. Some multi-agent systems use neural networks, but of course now you need to use a population of neural networks, right? The, the, the neural network that I use to identify, <coughs> to store your taste, remember that was what, the, what I said on Wednesday. On Wednesday I, I didn't say that the neural network captures aesthetic principles or anything. The neural net serves just like a recording, like an answering machine. An answering machine records your voice and plays back the message when someone calls, but the answering machine doesn't know that it's your voice, doesn't know who calls, doesn't know that it's a message, right? It's just a recorder, a passive recorder. The way I presented neural nets that day was as, a, as passive recorders of taste. You simply give them a bunch of examples of what you like, and they extract a pattern that, that they can use to recognize what you like. They are like an answering machine for taste. And, and I very, very clearly said that I was cheating, right? I said, because we don't have a formal aesthetics, we're going to need to have a bite. We need to have a, we, need, we don't need to bypass this problem. It's an obstacle, but there is a way around, there's a workaround that involves cheating. And that is cheating via taste. And, and grabbing a single neural net that you train with your test, and that single neural net is going to do the job. If you use neural nets as multi-agent systems, you're always going to need a community of neural nets. You're going to need a population of neural nets because that's the multi in multi-agent systems. And in addition, you don't have to give it neural nets if you don't want to. For instance, for the purpose of, uh, of, uh, of architecture, all you have to give them is a set of rules given by language without any neural nets. I specify when you find a wall, walk alongside it, or look for the door. Uh, yeah, you, you can give it explicit rules as to how to move in space, how to avoid collisions, and so on. It doesn't have to be done through, through neural nets. In fact, many cases it's easier not to do it through neural nets, because with neural nets then you have to train every agent one by one. Whereas with, when you give them rules, you devise the rules, you give them, and then you see what patterns emerge from the rules. So multi-agent systems can use any kind of artificial intelligence, symbolic, neural net, hybrids, combinations, right? And they can be as simple as possible. All they have to do is, in the, in the case of architecture, inhabit space in certain ways. Avoid collisions, you know, have a, for instance, have a rule that if there's congestion, avoid it and go into a less congested area, things like that that you never really had to train them to become like that. I would argue, ultimately, that multi-agent systems with neural nets would be more interesting because, because you didn't give them explicit rules. They developed their own rules and that would make them a little more interesting as far as I'm concerned. But from the, from the point of view of an application, from the point of view of that particular application, give them a fitness score to the building in terms of traffic patterns and patterns of occupability or habitability, if they, if they have neural nets or not, it's entirely irrelevant. Okay, so the second part of the question is, um, uh, in your article in the Digital Cities, uh, you refer to belief, desire, intention, agents as an aspect of um, multi-agent systems. And they are... As one kind of multi-agent system. Yes, yeah, they are symbolic agents. Um, and at the time I raised this question, because the, the, the guys in computer science here were saying symbolic, that's all, that's all hat now, and we're now doing mathematical things, where they're actually making risk calculations and, and basing things on, on, on that kind of uh, decision making. Uh, are you leaving behind symbolic now, beginning to shift into that territory, or...? Well, no, because, because they're not mutually exclusive. Beliefs belong over here. Language used for what is called a propositional attitude. A proposition is the meaning of a declarative sentence, right? In other words, it is what 
Snow is white, as in common with la nieve is blanca. Right? This is in Spanish, this is in English, both mean the same thing. The meaning of that sentence, what they both have in common, is a proposition. So propositional attitudes in analytical philosophy refer to attitudes towards propositions, towards the meaning of sentences. It can be that you believe them or that you cannot believe them. It can be that you desire them. Desire that outcome or desire the opposite outcome. And so belief, they, what was called BDI agents, are agents that first of all, that in which the behavior of the agent is planned in the following way. You first update the beliefs of the agent. For instance, if the agents are supposed to be looking for a resource, you update your beliefs as to, because now they can perceive that there's food over there, so now you update your beliefs with there's food to the right and, 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 and to the front, right? Then you check their desires to see if they're hungry, so that food is something that they would be willing to accept as a goal right now. And then you generate a commitment to action. A commitment to action that is called an intention. So only a commitment, because you might, you might have the intention to act, but you might be prevented from acting by something in the world. So it's only a commitment that you make to yourself, yes, I want to do this, yes, I intend to do this, yes, I'm committed to act this way. So you use beliefs to inform yourself about the world, you use desires, again, as propositional attitudes, to, uh, to form goals about the world, right? To go for food or not to go for food, and then you use intentions as commitments to action. That's what they are called, BDI agents. But I can perfectly well imagine that instead of, instead of using language, you can use mathematics, just as you said. You don't form beliefs by, form, by forming an attitude towards a sentence. You form beliefs because you have been calculating and updating conditional probabilities that something will occur or something will not occur. That is similar to saying, yes, I believe it will happen. But with conditional probabilities, you don't need that belief. All you need is somebody who has been exposed to events and every time it's exposed to an event, it changes the conditional probabilities that, that that event will occur in the future. That event had 90% chance of occurring before I encounter it again. Now that I encounter it once more, now it has a little bit more opportunity to do to. So instead of beliefs, you put statistical calculations of conditional probabilities. This will happen if this other thing happened. You can simulate desires in a similar way, just mathematical, yes intensities associated with different outcomes, not necessarily an attitude towards a proposition, and commitments to action can be done even without language. So how to implement agents is an entirely, it's entirely a matter of decision. <coughs> you, have you have different options, and as long as you're not trying to pretend that those agents mimic real human minds, as long as what you're trying to do is get emergent patterns of behavior from those agents, then it doesn't really matter which paradigm you use. Ideally, once you discover that a particular pattern emerges, you should try to move to, you should try to, move to another paradigm and see if the same pattern emerges. Because if the same pattern emerges with neural nets, with belief, desires, and intentions, and with the statistical calculations of conditional probabilities, then your result is probably very robust. If the pattern only occurs with one of the three designs and fails to occur with the other two, it might be an artifact of your choice of, 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 of multi-agents. It's like with anything else. If you use an optical microscope and you detect a certain globule in a, in a, in a, in a, in a bacterium, and then you use an electronic microscope and the image that comes is an electro, uh, electronic microscope, it's an entirely different thing because you have lenses and so on. It uses an entirely different imaging process but it shows you an image where the same globule is, then you have a, a much stronger evidence that that globule is a component of the bacteria than if only one of the two microscopes revealed them. Because what are the odds that two entirely different ways of imaging things are going to come up with the same image? Right? Same thing with multi-agent systems. The, the, I, the, the good thing of having so many choices is that then you can run several versions of the same thing, and if you get the same emergent pa pattern, then that pattern is not an artifact. That pattern was repeated 
as you change your assumptions, it's robust against the change in your assumptions, which gives you much, gives it a lot more weight. So I guess there is a, a, a question of semantics, the, the way that belief design imaginations were described to me by the guys at computer science as symbolic ones. As symbolic, and I, I got the impression what they were saying is that the belief doesn't have that, that component doesn't have that same reflexivity that you ascribe to it. They, they, you have a belief and you don't, you can't update it, whereas the mathematical ones are continually updated. Maybe so, I, I need to inquire that further. But, uh, well, it is, you know, I, I would totally, I would, it's, it's a good argument, can I put it this way? And, you know, and it, it, it pits the Bayesians. The Bayesians are the ones, you know, the followers of Bayes. Bayes was a, an English monk or priest or something who first created this, this use of a probability calculus to, to guide decision, to guide learning. It's a form of learning by updating conditional probabilities. You start with a certain way. If this event occurs, then it's 50% that this other event will all also occur, right? It's a kind of human association. And then by the more examples of the occurrence of the two events occur, the stronger your conditional probabilities get up to the point where you say, I can predict now with absolute certainty the second one is going to occur after the, sec after the first. In other words, I believe the second one will occur after the first, only you didn't use any language, you used math to get there, right? So this is the older kind of tradition. This goes back to Bertrand Russell and so on. It's a very English tradition. Right? They, they probably coined the term. And yes, it is symbolic. It is symbolic because it's using propositions. Propositions are the meanings of sentences. You cannot get any more symbolic than that. I don't have any problem with this. The only thing I have a problem with is when you start thinking that this is the absolute truth about beliefs and desires. Because I can have beliefs and desires about things that cannot be expressed linguistically. I can believe, when I'm looking at a pineapple, that that is going to taste like a pineapple. I, I, but I believe that because of my previous tastes of pineapple. In other words, I believe it in a neural net kind of way. I'm gonna, I can recognize the taste of pineapple, right? And I cannot put it into words. That's why I asked somebody before, you know, can you actually put into words what a pineapple tastes like? Because you can't, you know, you're going to come up with words like pineapple -y, right? But you cannot really put it into words. And you can have desires about things that you cannot put into words either. Either because too embarrassing to admit that you desire that, or simply because, you know, sometimes you have a very strong desire for strawberries at that point, let's say. Or for, you know, a very strong desire to, to drive fast in your car. That's a desire for the intensity directly. It's a desire directly for the flavor of strawberries. It's a desire for the intensity of the speed in your car that is not, does not pass through language. Even if you have to put it into language when someone asks you, what are you going to do? I have a very strong desire to leap in my car and go really fast. So beliefs and desires can be implemented with neural nets in terms of intensities only. And they can be implemented in terms of statistics. Or rather, a, an, an algorithm that updates conditional probabilities with every encounter. Or it can be defined as attitudes towards propositions. My, 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 my own opinion at this point is, is leave the question open because it might be that humans use all three forms. There, it, might, it might perfectly well turn out that we don't have this one way of learning, that we in fact have several ways of learning. And that trying to fit everything into just one model is just wrong, right? And I believe that that could perfectly be true. Part one, one of our ways of learning comes from animals, other ways of learning come from linguistic uh, learning and so on. And so, why don't we just keep them all? Right? As long as we keep them on this side of the board. As long as we don't insist that either probabilistic, you know, the, the patterns of conditional probabilities or whatever, 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 inform our perception of things. Because that is what I do not believe. I believe that all human beings basically perceive the same thing. To go back to her point, yes, that, that bag is green. We're seeing it from different angles. It's slightly different green, but it doesn't, that doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean it's not green. What it means is that the word green refers to a, a range of wavelengths bounced of objects, not necessarily green that is exactly between blue and, 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 and yellow.
yellow, right? So certain colors that are a little too close to the blue or a little too close to the yellow, we may have a doubt. You may call, uh, not this yellow, this is definitely yellow, yellow, but then just think of another color, right? Where we would have a doubt as to whether that is yellow or that is green, or whether that is yellow. Or that. And at that point, words may come in. But for a large variety of cases, we could just agree that it's red, depending, regardless of what angle we're looking at the thing, right? And the word, you know, for instance, I'm going to give you another example. My father was a, is, what, he's still alive, but he doesn't paint anymore, was a watercolor painter. And I know for sure that he can see more colors than I can. And I know that because he points to, to colors and he says, see the difference between those two reds? And come back. No. <laughs> they're, they're exactly the same. No, no, no. This is crimson. And the other one is, is, is you know, it's crimson something or other, right? Now, the question is, does he see more colors because he has more words for color? Or does he see more colors because vision is know-how? Because you learn how to discriminate more colors. Because vision is a skill that you develop and then you see more colors. My, my prefer, pre, I would prefer the answer, vision is a skill. You, you learn how to discriminate subtler and subtler differences in color. And adding the words are just a mnemonic device. That, you know, and, and where did you get the words anyway from? Winston and Newton, bottles of color. I mean, they are not even your words, right? So it's not as if I right now could go to his, 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 his paintings and read the label, oh, crimson, blue, and I go, ah, oh, so I can see the difference just because now I have the word. I have to train myself to see that difference. So this is another, this is another way in which know-how is to be introduced into our lives. Perception is know-how. You learn how to listen to sounds. You learn how you know, classical musicians are said to be able to hear more sounds than we can, to hear higher harmonics like Well, yeah, but they have to learn how to do that. They have to train their ear to do that. They don't do that by simply learning more terms for sounds. Yeah? No, I totally, I totally agree with your understanding. Yes? Um, it seems like the, the system that you're presenting, uh, in a way, are gradient or in time. Things added, uh, things, information get added on, and as you process it in time, you learn the behavior or the thoughts. Is it, could you consider affordance or capacity in a way? I know that there are different, some form of determinism, or say degrees of determinism. In other words, that they hold the capacity to become something. It's not fully determined in a linear causality sense, but it actually sets the conditions for its existence. Could determinism be considered somewhat of a potentiality? Well, yes. Yes, but let me let me then clarify this with let me just write down a few things here. Determinism has always been a magical sign. And causality can be divided, be divided into linear and non-linear. Linear causality, the formula is if C, standing for this cause, then E, always. If this cause occurs, then this effect will occur every single time. That's the terminism. If I know the cause, I know the effect. And global determinism says if all causality in the universe is linear, then God, being the first cause, already determined everything. Because from that first cause, follow a certain effect always. And from that, that effect acting as a cause, another effect followed, but except the one that was supposed to follow. So everything is so mechanically predetermined, right? That the whole question is where do we put free will? Because otherwise, we cannot be punished for our sins. Because if the first cause determined that I sin right now, then hey, don't send me to hell. You caused me to do this, right? So this has always produced qualm 
Psalms and theologians because it's determinism versus free will. Now, the problem is causality is not linear. Sometimes it is, but the majority of cases it's not. The first thing that you can challenge is the intensity of a cause and effect. The linear causality thing says a cause of the same intensity will produce an effect of the same intensity always. Now, some materials, in this case, the cause is going to be putting a load into, into a spring, and the effect is going to be the spring deforming by becoming longer, say. Right? So, here is the load, here is the deformation. So, this is the cause, this is the effect. In the case of mild metals, like mild steel, yes, causality is linear. Every time you increase the load, the thing becomes a little, a little uh, longer. You double the load, it becomes double longer. But as you, because you've seen me done this, as everybody knows, organic tissue does, is not linear because you you, a small cause causes a large amount of deformation, a small pull on, on your lip stretches it a lot, but then it doesn't matter how much you keep pulling, your lip doesn't keep going and pulling it. At some point it stops moving, right? Or a rubber balloon that responds like this. You try to inflate it at first, and it doesn't matter how much you try, you try, nothing, nothing, nothing yields, and all of a sudden, Right? That's this part over here. And then it go, again becomes resistant, it doesn't matter how much cost you're putting in, how much no air you're putting in, it, it won't inflate anymore, it will, it will burst. So this is the first challenge to causality. The intensities can become different. The second challenge to causality is called catalysis. A catalyst is just a trigger our entire bodies work with catalysis. Our DNA code codes in addition to code, coding for the structural proteins, you know, the proteins that make up our bones and make up our muscles and so on, they code, they, they code for enzymes which intervene to accelerate or decelerate processes and therefore control the timing of all metabolic processes. A catalysis can cause a particular effect in a particular part of a plant, say, for instance, there are certain uh, growth hormones that you apply to the leaves of a plant and, and inhibit growth. You apply them to the roots of a plant and promote growth. So that means that the same cause can produce different effects. So that's the, I mean, it's even a bigger challenge. Same cause, same hormone, different effect, inhibition, activation. And for the same reason, you can have different causes that produce the same effect. Not only this hormone, but this other hormone and this other hormone applied to the roots cause growth. Different causes, same effect. So now we have two challenges, right? The third one challenges the always part of the thing. It's called probabilistic causality. And it's the one that Neil was talking about a second ago. Because you learn via probabilities about this. Is, 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 I only want to give you one example. Cancer, uh, cigarette smoking causes cancer in 70% of the cases. It's not always, because it can be counteracted by genetics, can be counteracted by exercise, can be counteracted by diet, can be counteracted by a bunch of things, but 70% of the cases, smoking causes cancer. Well, that's, that's good enough to stop smoking cancer, but it's not deterministic. It's 70% of the cases. So, there are linear causes out there in the world, but the majority of causes are either non-linear, where intensities are related in different, more complex ways, or catalytic, in which the causes act merely as triggers, or probabilistic, in which the causes have to be all the big considered in a population, a population where there is variation, and where exercise and diet there might actually make you not get cancer from smoking. Whereas this guy who doesn't do any exercise and has a terrible diet gets cancer from smoking. You have to consider the variation. Once you add those three forms of catalysis, the whole problem of determinism versus free will falls apart.
because we human beings inhabit this world. And so, and so there's no, there's no real melodramatic point about what if God said this and everything is mechanistically reproducing, where is our free will? The world is complex. It's filled with, with non-linear forms of causality. Right. And those are the most interesting, by the way, from a designer point of view. In that, in that non-linear form, is, is calculus, which is kind of interesting, would you consider that to be Things that are outside of the Well, not necessarily because a catalyst has actually a very specific effect. I mean, this growth hormone, it's not going to transform the plant into some, you know, into an elephant or make it fly or turn it pink or make it glow. It either inhibits or makes grow. Right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the point being rather that applied to the roots of the plant causes growth. Applied to the leaves causes inhibition, causes that, right? But one and the same cause can have different effects. That is basically all it means. Probabilistic brings contingency with it. That, in a way, is what probabilistic means. It means all kinds of contingent factors, including the placebo effect, can influence what's going on here. It might even very well be that by just thinking, you no. Know, Cigarettes don't cause cancer. Cigarettes don't cause cancer. I'm holding that belief really strong. Some kind of placebo effect might actually allow you not to get sick from cigarettes. I mean, I don't know if that works. Don't do this at home, kids. <laughs> but probabilistic is the one that introduces contingency. All those effects that were left out of the cause that also affect the effect. So this is the sophisticated way of thinking about causality. This is the old-fashioned way of thinking about causality. This leads to theological puzzles that are ridiculous. A good example of this is the Matrix. And the whole plot of the Matrix, I mean, as, as much as I love you know, flying here and there, like the camera going around, and uh, Jesus, the fight, the entire plot goes around free will versus determinism. I mean, there's a whole discussion at the restaurant with a French guy, the annoying French guy. Right? Who is like, he's insisting that everything is causal because everything is causality, goes from one to the other, and the other ones are asking them, you know, no, but what about free will? And I'm sitting at the movie saying, like, is this movie taking place 2,000 years ago? I mean, what, what the hell is going on here? What a simplistic way of thinking about causality. Of course, the movie is good enough and it has such a good new look that I forgave all the bad philosophical thoughts behind it. Clearly, the directors think of themselves as philosophers, but they are like really crappy ones, right? So much for dumping on other people. Questions, guys? Okay, well then, that is one thing to be done. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Clapping is allowed.